This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Anyone can speculate as to what is going to happen in the end times, but when you watch the news and see what's going on in our world right now, suddenly guessing and conjecture are not good enough. The truth is the only thing that matters now. What's really going to happen before Yeshua returns, and what do we need to prepare to go through before he arrives? Tonight, Michael Root presents episode three of Mystery of Iniquity, because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Root. The book of the Revelation is fun to speculate about until you see it happening before your eyes. Then guessing is not fun anymore, and that's exactly where we're at in our world today. Just one look at the news, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, and that's why Michael is delivering his new series, Mystery of Iniquity, and tonight it's episode three, so stay tuned for that. Also, it's the third Shabbat in the month of Tevet on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. There you see it on your screen there. There are uh, still several months left on this calendar along with the amazing imagery from the real Mount Sinai area in Saudi Arabia. These photos were taken by Andrew Jones, some of which uh, have never been seen on film before and you can still get this calendar at arudawakening.tv slash calendar. Now, uh, speaking of calendars, we are 10 days into the Gregorian month of January, which means uh, we need to talk about a new love gift you can get courtesy of Michael Rood. Let's talk about that with the Director of Ministry Development for A Rood Awakening International David Robinson, welcome David. Thank you, it's good to be here. Good to be, yes, you know, first of all, let's talk about this. So crazy things going on in the news today. Like we said, um, Michael's talking about this on the mystery of iniquity, uh, it's crazy. Uh, one thing we were talking about before the cameras went on that uh, I find it very uh, ironic and, and idiotic, really, to use a, a Michael Rude term, uh, of folks to be joking about Iran on social media. I just find that uh, ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, I you know, people become desensitized to, to, to things that are very serious matters because of yeah. the social media. And uh, it, it's a scary thing to think um, what could happen with Iran. And, and you're talking about a culture um, and leaders that, you know, they don't mind killing people, innocent right. people. You know, so uh, that's one thing that our military, just like the attack that happened the other day, um, we're very, we pinpoint and try mm -hmm. to uh, minimize, you know, uh, collateral damage. Right. And so um, you're dealing with a, a, a group of people that they don't care. Well, they don't have the same, I mean, we have to remember, they, they don't necessarily have a Western mindset that we right. have grown up with. I mean, we have an entire generation, mine included, that have never seen real war, like right. World War II, and people are joking about World War III, like I said, on Instagram and Facebook and such. Yeah. But these people, uh, like you said, they, they don't care. They have a different mindset, and mm -hmm. it's something we don't really even understand. That's right. It's a, it's a scary thing. It really is. Yeah. And I, I hope, uh, I sure hope we don't go to war. That's right. Now, Mystery of Iniquity that Michael is teaching tonight, I mean, you kind of have a, an inside look on that. You used to work on uh, military grade things for the ICBMs, government. ICBMs, yes. ICBMs, mm -hmm. okay. Minute Min 3 missiles. And what you've seen there, I mean, this is uh, maybe more scary than people realize, right? Yeah, it could be. I mean, we always had exercises to prepare us for something like this, and, and generally you knew it was an exercise. And um, But even in an exercise, that thought goes through your mind, wow, this could actually happen. Wow. And, and it seems to be more of a reality today than ever. Wow. Well, all the more reason to get the word out about the Messiah because, right. you know, even the folks who are threatening us, we are told to pray for those who persecute us. That's right. So we need to get the word out to everybody, say, hey, Yeshua is the answer. Killing people is not the answer. That's right. Uh, and just have everybody put down their arms and say, hey, look, the one we really need to bow to is, is him. And yeah. uh, in order to help make that go forward, we have something every month called the Love Gift. Mm -hmm. The Love Gift is essentially just, uh, it, it's a monthly fundraiser mm -hmm. to help uh, put the word out there so 
that we can get the word further and further into places like Iran. I mean, our broadcasts are not in Iran yet, but I mean, people can get them however they want. That's people, right. you know, if they really want to see Michael's word, they can get it on the internet. Uh, but we have something called the Love Gift mm. that helps fund that. And right. the, it's a gift from Michael in, in response for your uh, support of different levels. Uh, this month, we have a level of $50, $100, and $300. And David, you helped put that together. So for a gift of $50, it's Michael's uh, new teaching called Don't Go to Jerusalem. Right. It's all about uh, Paul, even though he was told by friends of his uh, who heard from the Spirit saying, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You're gonna get persecuted. You might get trapped there. You might get killed there. Don't go. He said, you know what? I know. I believe you, but I'm going anyway. Right. Uh, so it's a kind of an interesting thing where uh, this teaching is all about, well, if, if friends are telling you something from the Spirit and you're hearing something from the Spirit, what do you do? Yeah. And so that's what this teaching all is about. So that's a gift of $50 or more. And for a gift of $100 or more, you'll get that and uh, this. What's this all about here? This is a nice wine cup and you can see that there's um, the, the city of Jerusalem Jerusalem around it, and then it also has a scripture, I think it's Psalms 130, 137, I think, seven, right? five, yeah. Okay. And it says that if I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. Ah. And so it's a beautiful cup. And then along with that, we also have the mezuzah, and it's a pewter um, mezuzah. Okay. And it has a shemal on it, of course, and it has the scroll that you can put behind it, and then you mount it onto your doorpost. Okay. Now this is something, what, what is a mezuzah, in case people have never heard this well, before? Well, it's Deuteronomy 6, <coughs> and it's the, the Shema, Hero of Israel. Okay. And uh, what, one thing I love about this is it's a great ministry tool. Because you have this on your door, and, and people from the Amazon guy to whoever comes and, <laughs> and goes, hey, what is this on your door? And you get to explain to them what it is. Okay. And so um, a lot of these gifts can be used for ministry tools. Maybe one day we'll have a mezuzah that's actually also a ring doorbell where you can see that who's coming. That would be the, really the neat. And, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> but that is not this right now. So, <laughs> right. And that, that scripture down in there is, is Hebrew, actually. Actually, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a gift for $100 or more. For $300 or more, we actually have two more wonderful gifts you'll get in addition to this and the teaching. Uh, David, tell us about what we have here. Well, we have the shofars on this nice uh, marble uh, base here, and it has Jerusalem. You can see Jerusalem. Or and uh, Shabbat no, Shalom actually, in Hebrew. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. There is a scene of Jerusalem, though, in yeah. there as well. It is. Yeah, I need my glasses. <laughs> but anyway, you have these nice little uh, candles that you put in it, and you can place this on a counter or anywhere, and uh, it's yeah. a nice little... Peace. Great to light Love some it. candles before Shabbat yeah. if you like doing that type of thing. And uh, also, now there's a beautiful plate over here. This is sort of a, it's a meant to be a display plate because it comes with, uh, you know. It's got the little stand the here that you can on put a, it a built on. It. Yeah. Uh, it's not to eat this? on. I'm sure you could, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> Jerusalem, the city of the great king, the joy of the whole earth. And it has the uh, ceremonial, uh, it has the altar of incense here, it has the menorah, and the city of Jerusalem. Right, and another, again, like you said, a teaching tool. When folks right. come into your house, they can look at this and go, what is this? What, what's the scene on here? Right. And you can just explain right. that this is part of, actually, as a Christian, this is part of your heritage. You know, this is mm -hmm. maybe something you never knew about and uh, start spreading the word and that especially way. Especially a lot of people don't have, they, they're like, hey, how do, you, how do you actually witness? These are... Uh, items that can help break into conversation and then right. you can actually witness to an individual. Exactly, to be a witness. And right. just to have these things in your house, you're actually being a witness. So thanks for joining us yeah, today, David. great. All right, now, if you want to know what's behind the headlines in our world today, we'll just keep on watching. Michael Rood is next with episode three of Mystery of Iniquity, based on Michael Rood's best-selling book called The Mystery of Iniquity. So stay tuned for that and get your bread and wine ready for The Kiddish with Michael. That's coming up next. Figuring out what the Almighty wants you to do with your life is hard enough. But what do you do when your believing friends and family share advice from the Holy Spirit that just doesn't seem to make sense? Michael Rood shares what Paul the Apostle did in a situation like this in a new teaching called, Don't Go to Jerusalem. But who wants to go to Jerusalem? Who says, I don't count my own life dear, I just want to finish this thing. He was tired. Don't Go to Jerusalem by Michael Rood reveals the behind-the-scenes story you've never heard about Paul's decision to face persecution head-on. An inspiring call to run our race as believers in courage and faith. This groundbreaking teaching is not for sale. It's a gift from Michael Rood in appreciation for your $50 donation to help spread the truth of the Messiah's ministry. Donate $100 or more and you'll also receive a handmade resin and stainless steel wine cup 
depicting a scene from ancient Jerusalem. Plus, a pewter mezuzah containing a miniature Torah scroll. Hang it in your doorway to welcome everyone who enters your home. Or for a gift of $300 or more, you'll receive Don't Go to Jerusalem, the resin and stainless steel cup, the pewter mezuzah, plus this gorgeous pewter plate featuring scenes from the Second Temple, and a twin ram's horn shofar candle holder. Get this collection now, available in January only. It's a gift from Michael Rood to thank you for helping to spread the true message of the Messiah through a Rood Awakening International. You'll get the Don't Go to Jerusalem teaching for a love gift of $50 the teaching, the stainless steel cup, and the pewter mezuzah for a gift of $100 or more. Or get everything plus the pewter plate and ram's horn candle holder for a love gift donation of $300 or more. Get these gifts now while supplies last. Call 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or visit monthlylovegift.com. The Chronological Gospels Bible is changing lives all over the world putting everything the Messiah did in exact chronological order and explaining the behind-the-scenes truth of what the Messiah did, when He did it, and why. The timing of it all means everything. And now, the Chronological Gospels can be easier on your eyes. The larger print edition features 40% larger type, and every page appears exactly the same as the original so you can follow along with others who have the regular size version. The Chronological Gospels Larger Print Edition also has wider margins to write notes, and the premium quality paper means you can highlight without soaking through. Plus, the Larger Print Edition lies flat, so you can teach without having to hold the book open. The Chronological Gospels Larger Print Edition is a big and beautiful coffee table book measuring a full 12 inches tall and 9 inches wide. Study the Bible with clarity and ease. I love the size of this book. This is 9 by 12. The paper is, is perfect because it doesn't bleed through when I write on it. I can mark it up, and I always make notes in all my Bibles. Everything is the same place as it is on the smaller version, and I can just stand back and I can teach from it, and it's just, it's the perfect size. I pray thee, of whom speaks this prophet? Order the Chronological Gospels Larger Print Edition by phone or online. You'll get 40% larger type than the original. Call 800-788-7887. That's 800-788-7887. Or get the Chronological Gospels Bible Larger Print Edition online at arudeawakening.tv slash large. The last night that Yeshua was with his disciples, the last supper before the Passover was sacrificed, he took bread and he took wine. He said before that Abraham saw his day and rejoiced, but what does that mean? He saw his day and rejoiced. Well, it was the Melech Zadik, the king of righteousness that brought forth bread and wine to Abraham. He blessed the Most High with the blessing that Abraham taught Yitzhak, Yitzhak taught Yaakov, and is still spoken today. Whenever bread and wine is served at a Jewish table, whenever it is Sabbath, especially around the world, the bread and the wine are brought forth with this blessing. Baruch Gata Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Borei Pari Hagafen. Blessed are you, 
Yahovah, our Elohim, king of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua then said, blessed are you, Yahovah, our Elohim, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. He said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. This represents my shed blood that pays the sin penalty because of the broken covenant. As often as we do this, as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. So break the bread, share the wine, and we do this in remembrance of him until he comes. The fear of the Lord, the fear of Yehovah, is the beginning of knowledge, without which there are some things that cannot and never will be understood. As Yeshua said, and I paraphrase, you will only get as much truth as you will obey. If you don't obey the truth that you have, even that truth will be taken away from you. Obedience is absolutely required. If you don't obey the truth that you have, you won't receive any more truth. You will be forever learning, but not able to come to a knowledge of the truth. You will go down a path of ever learning and end up on the broad path of religion that leads all men to destruction. Yeshua said the gate that leads to life is extremely narrow and very few people will find it. And the path, grows more narrow and more narrow all along the way. Very few people will want to stay on that path, but that is the path that leads to life. It is a path. It is not a one-time action in the past. As Paul said, this is the word concerning faith that we preach. This is found in Romans chapter 10 and verse nine. If we want to know what salvation is, then you have to understand exactly what Paul is saying here because Yeshua and Paul are on the same plane. Paul is repeating what Yeshua taught and he is repeating it throughout his epistles. Uh, So many people forget that even though the majority of the scriptures were not around at that time, the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew was readily available. That Paul traveled with Luke for years. Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke, who said, even though others had set in hand, uh, set out to write these things in order, he had knowledge right of these things right from the beginning, and he laid these things out. So do not think that Paul doesn't understand the words or the teachings of Yeshua. Uh, the whole idea that Luke was a Gentile physician is a fairy tale made up by Gentile Christians. No, Luke, or Lucius, as in the book of Acts, was part of the synagogue at Antioch, the same place where Simon of Cyrene was, where Barnabas was, where Timothy was, where all these saints moved out from Antioch and turned the world upside down, as the scriptures say, from Antioch. This is where Silas and and Paul went out from there with Timothy, from this location. And and Luke was part of that synagogue, part of all the saints coming, going from Jerusalem to Antioch. They were like the two capitals of Messianic Judaism. Messianic Judaism, not, excuse me. I said that wrong. Judaism is ancient Phariseeism. There is no such thing as a messianic version of what Yeshua said, do not do and do not follow. 
He said, do not follow the Takanot and the Maasim of the Pharisees. Their rules and regulations of which they've subtracted from the Torah and they've added to the Torah, they made up their own religious system. That's the world Yeshua came into. These were Jews, they were Messianic, and they were in the synagogue. They were followers of the Messiah. Just as it says in the book of Acts, when, when Paul came up and James said, you see how many Jews, uh, how many Jews there are a multitude of Jews who believe. There was a multitude, multitudes of Jews who believed in Yeshua. And they are all zealous for the Torah. They were all keeping the Torah. There's, there, they hadn't been done away with. Yeah, these people were not uh, eating dog, pig, cat, rat, muskrat. They weren't, they weren't committing adultery with other uh, apostles and disciples' wives. They weren't having sex with, with sheep or, or any of the abominations that uh, the Gentiles think they can get away with. They, they're not lying, they're not stealing, they're, they're not uh, coveting their neighbor's goods. You know, they, they are still zealous for the Torah, but, but Shaul, Paul, they were uh, maliciously informed that, that he was teaching the Gentiles to forsake Moses. No, he was teaching the Gentiles and the Jews among the Gentiles that you don't follow the Takanot and the Masim of the Pharisees, the rules and regulations they invented, their religion that, that, that goes against the word of God. They've added to, they've subtracted from, and they have no authority. That's what he was teaching. Well, let's, uh, let's get into this in more detail. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1. you wanna understand the book of Revelation, which is the outline, it's from, from here to eternity. It gives us everything Yeshua said, everything the prophets have said, everything that Moses has said, it is all encapsulated finally. It's all boiled down to this very book that Yeshua wrote with John as a scribe. Yeshua, after 60 years at the right hand of God, his hair is shocking white. He's got a tan, it's like you know, burnished brass. His hair is white like wool. His eyes are on fire. When he speaks, it's, it echoes like a you know roaring mighty oceans. And when John sees him, he falls down like a dead man. And as he is told by Yeshua, write the things that you've just seen. Yeshua, in all of his glory, walking among the lampstands, which are the, uh, the seven assemblies. Nobody pulls any wool over on his eyes. He knows everything that's going on. Write what you just saw. Then write the things which are now. These are my messages. I want you to communicate these to the seven assemblies in Asia Minor. And then I want you to write the things which shall be hereafter. And John is taken to the throne room. He really goes to heaven. He really sees the throne room the way it is now. Not some kind of mystical fairy tale, not some kind of ascended masters nonsense among the, uh, the, the demonic infested uh, new age morons. And I use that term in its biblical sense. As Yeshua did. He said there were five wise virgins and there were five moron virgins, Greek, okay? So it's not hate speech. I'm just saying they're not, they're not wise. They're the opposite. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. This is a revelation of Yeshua Messiah, which God the Father, Yehovah, gave to him, Yeshua, to show to his servants, his servants, the things which must swiftly come to pass. This is written to the servants of the Messiah. They're the only ones that can understand it, but you have to have a command of the scriptures from Genesis 1-1 all the way through 
It all is one, one, one book, one revelation, one revealing of God's plan, of God's heart, what it's all about from when we are ejected from the Garden of Eden until we get to go into the garden in the paradise and the new heaven and new earth. It's all one story. It's not a series of numbered song bites that you can interpret whatever way you want to. It's not to your own idiosapalusis, your own letting loose and just stripping it from its context and this is what it means to me. No, this is to the servants and they're the ones that can understand it. And he said and it signified it by his messenger, not angel, Agalos, messenger, his servant, Yohanan, his servant, John who is his doulos, his doulos, his messenger and his doulos. John was a doulos, a sold out bond slave. Just as we all are, Yeshua has paid the price. He set us free and now we willingly serve him. We do it because his grace has saved us. And when his grace saves us, we are saved by grace then our natural response is because the Torah is then written on our heart, and so we want to do it. We want to do the Torah. You know, this, this, is, this is the Torah right here, people. This, these are the five, five books of Moses right here. That's all there is. It's not difficult. This is what John says. The writer of the Gospel of John says, the Torah is not difficult, it's not burdensome. What are burdensome? The rules and regulations of men that you grew up in their religious system under their thumb and you've got to keep their rules and regulations and you never measure up. You, they have to keep you down with sin consciousness. You feel guilty because you haven't measured up. No, if you violated the Torah, you're in sin. If you don't violate the Torah, then you're not in sin. Get over it, people. Get over your religious proclivities that, that say you're never good enough. No, you are ambassadors for the Messiah. He has given you a job to do. You're to operate as a priest and king in this life now. If you will do your job, you will be rewarded and you will get to live and reign with Messiah for a thousand years. You are in training right now. And if you don't Learn what you're supposed to learn now. Don't worry, you're not gonna be sitting around heaven on a cloud, strumming a harp, asking stupid questions for eternity to find out. No, you figure it out now. And if you don't figure it out now, you're not going to be rewarded with responsibility, governorship, dominion over seven cities, over five cities, over 10 cities. No, no. All you've done in life will be torched on the sea of fire and glass. You'll be saved, yet so is by fire. You made it, you made it. Well, when it comes to hearing your name called into the marriage supper of the Lamb, you can forget it. Only those who have made their garments white and are so honored by the Messiah as to hear their name called, called by name. Ladies and gentlemen, this story has got to get told. And this is how we're gonna tell it. Now, I'm going to, to read right straight from the scroll which is on my desk. This is a, the Revelation scroll. And the Revelation scroll, I'm gonna take you through this whole thing, but I want to give you a glimpse because this is Yeshua who is walking among the seven flaming lamps, which are the seven spirits of God before the throne, typified upon the earth as a menorah, but the menorah was just a type, a semblance. It's, a, it's patterned after the seven flaming spirits of God before the throne room of God, at the shore of the sea of fire and glass, which is just past the altar of incense. We have the throne, we have the altar of incense, we have the seven spirits of God, we then have the, uh, the sea of fire and glass, and then out in front of the sea of fire and glass, which is represented upon the earth as a brazen laver, that is when we have the brazen altar of sacrifice. 
This is the picture, the scene in heaven. Yeshua is walking among the lampstands. He has seven stars in his hand, which are the messengers to the seven assemblies in Asia Minor. In other words, he walks among the lampstands. He sees everything that's going on. No one is pulling the wool over his eyes. He's gonna tell these people, you've done a good job on some of these things, but on these other things, you better get it together. You better overcome this. I'm telling you, you take care of it, or I'll take care of it. If I have to take care of it, it's not gonna be a pretty picture. And there's no reward if I have to take care of it. This is our job as priests and kings. That's where we are in the book of Revelation. We're at the beginning, we are priests and kings. Are we gonna do our job, or are we not gonna do our job? He's got the messengers of these assemblies in his hand. He can crush them. They are in his hands. He can do with them what he wants. And if they don't deliver the message, he can snuff them out like that. And so these so-called preachers, these so-called televangelists, all this Christian television, this is, this is a travesty. Christian television ought to do more than raise money. They say we're raising money to get the gospel of the kingdom out of the world, and you never hear them teach the gospel of the kingdom. You never hear them teach what Yeshua taught. Oh, they blow smoke up each other's skirts and uh, you know tell sweet Jesus stories, and we got a whole network of the uh, uh, the people supernaturally going to heaven and, and doing all this, and angels coming down and speaking to people, and it's like. You know, these, yeah, right. How about vetting some of this stuff? How about vetting it according to the word of God? Now, I'm gonna read one passage, one passage uh, right, right here. This is to the believers in F Ephesus. Okay. He talks about the things that they're doing good and they have this to their credit, they hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And then he says, hear and obey, Shema, hear and obey, exactly what Moses says about Yeshua, you must hear and obey, hear and obey what the Spirit says to all the congregations. He that overcomes these things will be permitted to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. What a beautiful promise. He that overcomes these things, and he gives them a promise that's not fulfilled until the end of the scroll. After the final judgment, after those whose names aren't written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire, after Satan and death and hell are cast in the lake of fire and there's a new heaven and a new earth. And now, New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, a city, and in the midst of it is the garden. And what is in the midst of the garden? The tree of life. Yeshua is promising them, if you overcome these things that I'm telling you about, then you will get to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden, the paradise of God. See, now this is where we have to, to get into the detail that, that so many people are thinking, well, the thief on the cross, he did the, the, this last minute uh, Hail Mary, <laughs> so to speak, this last minute, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Yeshua said, and I'm gonna say it two different ways because there is no punctuation in Hebrew or Greek. Behold, I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Or is it, behold, I say unto thee, comma, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Well, we just have to take a look at the scripture. We just have to understand the, the basis, and so we know how and where to put the commas because a lot of Bible translators and commentators don't even put it in the right place. Behold, I say unto thee today, while we are both hanging on a cross, it looks like the end. I am gonna be, and I've already told my disciples, I'm gonna be dead, 
buried and in the grave for three days and three nights and I will rise on the third day. I myself am not gonna be in paradise on this very day. As a matter of fact, Paradise was discontinued in the Garden of Eden and doesn't appear again until the end of the book of Revelation, which I will be elucidating, I will be articulating to John, who is going to write all these things 60 years from now, so that my people will not have to be stupid. So they will know that paradise, that that the curse has ended in paradise and the tree of life will be in the garden at the end and you will be with me in paradise. This is where it gets exciting, ladies and gentlemen, because this man on the cross, hanging there, he is not going to get up at the next resurrection when Yeshua returns and gathers together those who are in Messiah. And we're gonna get into this. Those who are in Messiah, he's not gonna get up then. He's not going to go to the sea of fire and glass and, 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 and be rewarded for what he's done. And then get to come back with Yeshua. He's not going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He is not going to live and reign with Messiah on the earth for a thousand years. He said, you're gonna be with me in paradise. After the thousand years, after the thousand years, then the last resurrection happens. After the heavens and the earth are dissolved, burn away with the fervent heat, as Peter says. The universe is dissolved, everyone is gonna stand before God. Mao Zedong, Hitler, your favorite politician in Washington, Venezuela, wherever you live, Stalin. They are all gonna get up, whether they like it or not, whether Christopher Hitchens believes in God or not, it doesn't make any difference. He's gonna stand before the throne of Yeshua and everyone's gonna be judged according to their works, everyone. No matter what program you're watching, no matter what series we are currently showing on Shabbat Night Live or is being broadcast out to the world, it would not be possible without the Chronological Gospels. It took me 50 years to produce this work. Over 300 individual incidents in the life and ministry of Yeshua in chronological order. Why did I do this? Why it was so important to me? Is because Moses said that there would be another prophet coming in the future, a prophet that we must shema, we must hear and obey. But those words, that prophecy didn't come from Moses, it came from directly from the Almighty, that he would send another prophet in the future that we must hear and obey. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, actually quoting that prophecy of Moses, said those who do not hear and obey him will be destroyed. It is eternal judgment, ladies and gentlemen. The chronological gospels is the foundation of everything that we do because Yeshua is the foundation. He is the living word. And if we don't understand Yeshua's words, then we will not understand. We put this out to the world and we bring these programs to you because you have supported this ministry. We need you to continue to support this ministry. And right now we're gonna give you two minutes and that's all. Okay, that's all the interruption that we're gonna have. And this is a time that we need you to call in, we need you to write in, we need you to click the little dot that says, I'm gonna donate, and donate now. Thank you for standing with us. You have to get this firmly in mind. Those who are in Messiah, those who have died in Messiah, whether they have not taken the mark of the beast and they're beheaded, or they were killed in Uganda, you know, preaching the the gospel, you know, a hundred years ago from from now. Whatever the situation, those who are in Messiah, their dead, corrupted body will be raised into a incorruptible body. The mortal, still living, will put on immortality. At the last trump, the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and those which are alive and remain shall be caught up, herpazo, raptura, together with them to meet the Lord there and ever shall they shall ever be with the Lord. Not forever in the air because we're gathered together on the sea of fire and glass. 
where the works that we have done for him are the gold, silver, and precious stones that Paul speaks of that are purified in the fire, the sea of fire and glass, and the wood, hay, and the stubble, the things that we've done for not, for not. Everything that we've gained in this life are burned up. It's trash. And then we wait to hear if our name is called into what can only be called the marriage supper of the Lamb, the most intimate, the most intimate, personal, friends, the ones Yeshua wants to dine with at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Everyone else waits outside for seven days on the sea of fire and glass. Thinking, I would have, I should have, I coulda. After the seven day marriage supper of the Lamb, Yeshua then returns to the earth with his armies from heaven. Everyone on the sea of fire and glass is empty. The angels come down, and that is when the angel says, Get ready to eat the flesh of kings and captains and great, great men. Tell the birds to get ready to eat. In the next verse, the birds are eating. Yeshua then lives and reigns on earth for a thousand years. The saints live and reign as priests and kings, what we've been training for, for a thousand years. And then at the thousand years, Satan is released from his prison. He goes out to deceive the nations of the world. And then fire comes down from heaven and incinerates the universe. The heavens and the earth are gone. And everyone who's ever lived stands before the throne. And everyone is judged out of the books. There are two books. One is the scroll, two categories at least. The scroll of works. And everyone is judged according to their works. How many eons this takes for everyone to be judged, we don't know. But in the back of the line is a thief on the cross. He walks up and he sees all these people whose names were not written in the book of life and they're cast in the lake of fire. He sees as an angel, grabs someone who says, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Didn't I do wonderful works? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? And he he sees Yeshua look at him and say, I don't know you. You, worker of anomia, A without nomos, Torah. You who had your whole religion, and you didn't obey me, you didn't obey the commandments of God, you did your own thing, I don't know you. Oh, you think you did wonderful works in my name, I don't know you. Depart. And an angel grabs him and throws him in a lake of fire. This thief has done nothing. He has done nothing. All he said is on the cross, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. He wasn't there for the millennial reign. He is now seeing those who said they belong to the the Lord. He's seen them cast in the lake of fire. And then he walks up and the scroll of his works is read. You murdered this person. You have broken the commandments of God. You did this, you did that. And the man is staying there knowing it's all over. And then Yeshua said, Bring me the other scroll. And they bring him the scroll of life. Yeshua rolls it out, turns around, says, look at this. Here's your name. Here's your name. He then gets to inherit the new heaven and the new earth. He is going to be with Yeshua in paradise. That is when paradise is restored. That's when that 
thief, that robber will get up and his name is written in the book of life. Why? Because he deserved it? No. This is the wonderful grace of Yeshua. Greater than all our sin, how shall my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? Washing away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Yeshua has rescued me. Now we go on down to the believers in Smyrna. Some of you will be cast in prison to try you and you'll have tribulation 10 days, but be faithful until death. It's just a short time. You know, 10 days is like, okay, you know, it, it doesn't literally mean 10 days. It's like, okay, your, 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 your tribulation, being in prison, it's just gonna be for a short time. Compared with eternity, it's like 10 days. It's gonna be long, feel long while you're doing it, but be faithful to death and I will give you a crown of everlasting life. He that overcomes with these things will not be harmed of the second death. When is the second death clear to the end? The second death, those cast into the lake of fire, it's not going to come upon them. You can be thankful for that. Ah, here it is to the believers in Thyatira. He that overcomes these things, I'm not gonna go into what you have to overcome, but it's very specific what you're to overcome. It's not a general category of uh, overcomers, but he that overcomes these things will be given authority over the nations. He shall rule over them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces as defiled vessels of pottery. Just as I received the morning star from my father, I will give this reward to those who keep my works until the end. This is Psalm 2. This is what all of Israel was expecting and hoping for. Not the suffering servant, not the lamb before his shears was dumb, not the one who would have his heel bruised uh, but would bruise the head of the serpent. No, they're, they're looking for the Messiah who will rule the nations with the rod of iron. He says, you will rule with me. Just as I've received this promise of my Father, I'm giving this promise to you. There is no promise about going to heaven and sitting on a cloud. That, again, is Christianity nonsense. That is, that's a word from hell. Com to completely, to disregard everything that Yeshua says. I've had it. I have had it. I am going to war. I'm going to war over this travesty. And if you want to go to war with me, stay tuned. Be with me. Because we're not letting up. We have even begun to touch this. Then, to Sardis, they that overcomes these things shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out their name from the book of life, but I will call out their names before my Father and his holy angels. These are the ones that John sees when they are called by name into the marriage supper of the Lamb. John falls down like a dead man at the feet of the angel. He cannot believe the incredible as he sees these people walk by with white garments, which are the righteous acts of the saints, the righteousnesses of the saints. They are clothed with garments that show their whole life story. When John sees this, He's, he, he craters. He can't believe it. He falls down at the feet of the angel and the angel says, get up. You were told to write this stuff down, now write it down. This is a testimony of Yeshua. This is a spirit of this whole prophecy. This is so that the believers will know that it's worth anything and everything, whatever they have to go through to be clothed in white raiment and to hear their names called into the Mishkan in heaven, into the heavenly tabernacle, to tabernacle with Yeshua at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's worth everything. Ladies and gentlemen, this is reality. 
this pie in the sky heaven, going to heaven and seeing, you know, your pet dog and your grandmother, you know, and oh, oh yeah, and having a reunion with all your families. Oh, yeah, yeah, like that's gonna be a real bargain. You you can hardly stand one day a year getting together with all your relatives, and now you're gonna spend eternity with them? Yeah, that's supposed to be heaven? All these, all these ridiculous things. Oh yeah, we're, we're gonna go to the big porker table in the sky. We're gonna go to that big football stadium in the sky. You know, all these things. It's like whatever is important to you in this life, you get to go to that big whatever, that big bordello in the sky. You know, it's time to wake up and quit following a false prophet like Muhammad and Joseph Smith and all these other so-called religious leaders when Yeshua is the one that we follow. But we don't know anything about what he says because we don't read his words. We just take these other idiots' word for it. Ah, so, here we go. I'll read another one. He that overcomes these things will be allowed to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. But Yeshua's throne is going to be on the earth. Isaiah tells us that the Messiah will sit in the tabernacle of David on his throne. How is this going to happen? Because you all thought that the tabernacle of David and the Ark of the Covenant, which is the representation of the throne of God upon the earth, which is the Messiah's millennial throne, you thought that uh, that just disappeared. Or you read a verse out of the book of Revelation, which happens after the last trumpet in which the saints are gathered together on the sea of fire and glass, and the Ark of the Covenant is seen in the tabernacle in heaven, which is where Yeshua is gonna sit for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then he's gonna bring that throne back with him and rule from that throne upon the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, the tabernacle of David and the Ark of the Covenant were both hidden by Jeremiah. We're gonna get into that in some detail because Yeshua reveals this to Paul. But yet, because people are reading English and not even bothering to read the Greek, and with the Greek translation behind it, which is the Hebrew, which is the Paul's native language, they're neglecting to read the words of the prophet. So, just as he sat down with the Father on his throne, we will be invited to rule with Yeshua as priests and kings upon the earth. We will see all these things come to pass from here to eternity. Now, to get into the mystery of iniquity, the behind the scenes working of Satan as the God of this age, to see what he is doing now as the accuser of the brethren before the throne of God, as we see in Revelation 12. And as we see in the second chapter of Job, that Satan goes around about the earth and then comes before the throne of God to accuse Job. This is what he does. He is the accuser, the maleficent accuser of the brother, whereas Yeshua is the advocate, the righteous advocate before the throne. And we can take our petitions before him, our petitions for righteous judgment, just as the early believers did in the book of Acts. They took their case before the throne of heaven when Peter was in prison about to be executed, and Peter was delivered, and Herod, in a short amount of times, was eaten by worms. We can bring these things before the throne in heaven. That's what we do as priest and king. <music> 